Woo! If you see one of the organisers, do thank them for the amazing, one of the actual organisers, not me. This is just a specialist track. One of the actual organisers that puts on this entire event. Let them know that you enjoy it. It'd be a nice thing to do. Whatever. I'm special. Um, we have an amazing talk, which I think is the star of today. Um, Lily Ryan is going to be presenting Star, 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 a symphony of horror. Um, <laughs> Lily is a software engineer um, from Australia, funny that. Um, following a stint as an academic specialising in surveillance mechanisms of medieval Europe. Ooh. More recent years, she has, has seen her teaching practical tech privacy to the public, giving talks on history and the ethics of technology, and camouflaging herself in libraries. Neat. Let's make her feel welcome. And step one is making sure this is on. <clears throat> um, yeah, also I have a cold, so if I have to stop and clear my throat and take a drink, I'm sorry, but we'll get there. Um, okay, so as Katie said in longer words, I'm Lily, and this is a horror story about passwords. And here's my Twitter handle, in case you want to be friends with me on the internet, which would be nice. Um, and drawing on good horror stories, I'm going to be using images throughout this slide deck that are taken from the 1922 movie Nosferatu, which was the first vampire movie ever made. And I'm doing this because, like vampires, uh, like vampires, passwords are life-draining. <laughs> and they keep me awake at night in terror. And also because most password policies are about as well-written as Twilight. <laughs> Um, I'm, also, I'm also going to be mentioning a few different Django-specific packages and things in this talk, and a lot of other blog posts and news articles and so on and so forth. Um, so to save you trying to frantically take pictures of anything that I'm talking about uh, that you want to look up later, I've collected all of my research and I've put it at this link, and I'll share the link again at the end of the talk, so don't panic if you miss it now. Um, but this is where you will find all of the stuff that I mention as we go, in case you need to refer back to it. Okay, so if you follow tech news in any capacity, you will hear every day about databases of username and password combinations being dumped all over the place. Usually these news articles will come with heavy uses of the words cyber and dark web, and probably one of those pictures of someone in a hoodie or you know, a bunch of zeros and ones scrolling up the screen with the word password in the middle of it all somewhere because the cybers are scary. Um, and if you've been using the internet for a while, you'll probably have noticed that passwords kind of suck. And if you've been working in, a so in, in software for a while, you'll notice that passwords really suck. And we all kind of take the presence of passwords for granted. You sign up for an email account, you have a password. You get a new job and you need to access your work system, it's another password. And you sign up for Netflix, that's another password and probably a shared password because you'll share the Netflix account with everyone in your house. And so that goes on the fridge next to the Wi-Fi password that you also probably have, hopefully. And we know that the most common passwords are still QWERTY and 123456 and password. And we know that most people use the same password for multiple accounts because it's easier to remember that way. And that a non-zero amount of people will write a password on a post-it note and put it on their monitor <coughs> so they don't forget it. And despite all of the interesting and glamorous new software exploits that get discovered every day um, and get talked about a lot at things like DEF CON, basic password compromise is still the most common way to quote unquote get hacked. Restrictive password policies contribute to choosing bad passwords and repeat passwords. And the choices, with how we, the, the choices that we make when we store these passwords as database owners, that contributes a lot to how this information gets leaked online or whether or not it does. And the fact that many services still have password, passwords as their only form of authentication 
contributes to passwords still continuing to be a single point of failure in this whole thing. But despite being pretty basic in some ways, all of these things are really important. And how we got ourselves into this particular mess is also important. And I want to tell you about how we got to this point for two reasons. The first reason, as some of you know, in addition to doing things with code and consulting, et cetera, et cetera, and as Katie said earlier, I'm a historian. And I'm interested in why and how we got to where we are and more importantly, why we still keep doing it to ourselves. And the second and probably more urgent reason to tell you about this selfishly is because I am bored of hearing about passwords all the time. Passwords are pretty bad technology with several different bad implementations. And I would rather be doing something more interesting with my time than running around and cleaning up the mess that's left by passwords. And the reason I want to tell you folks about this is because we are the ones who can really do something about it. We're your IT folk and your testers and your developers and your sysadmins. And sometimes we're consultants and sometimes we work in-house and sometimes we're the ones who get called up by our friends and family to help them choose a new antivirus and back up their software and so on and so forth. But we are the ones who have the influence and the ability to do something about this situation. So if you're as tired as I am, of hearing about passwords being leaked and accounts being hacked, then join me in helping to fix this for everybody. So here is a horrible history of awful passwords, followed by a list of five ways we can stop doing this to ourselves over and over again, because we deserve nice things. Once upon a time, there was a password. And this password was open sesame. And it protected a cave where a bunch of thieves were hiding the treasure that they'd stolen. There was no two-factor auth on this cave. <laughs> One day, a guy called Alibaba was in the neighborhood, and he saw the thieves saying open sesame and getting into the magic cave. So he exploited this by waiting until they'd left, walking up to the cave and saying open sesame. And he got in, and he had a look around, and he took one of the bags of coins that they'd stolen. He left the cave, and he went and he bought a new house, and probably a really cool set of speakers. And the thieves came after him to kill him and to take back the loot that he'd stolen that they'd stolen. And after a protracted and dramatic series of events, Alibaba killed them all. And then he was the only one who knew the password, which is how the first thief should have kept it in the first place. So that story, which usually goes by the name of Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, is allegedly thousands of years old. It is at least 300 years old, which is still pretty old. <clears throat> Here's another one that's a little less old than that, but still a bit older than the internet. Once upon a time, in about the coldest part of the Cold War, there was a president of Ann America. <laughs> this president, <clears throat> this president decided that the United States stockpile of nuclear weapons probably needed some kind of controls so that they didn't get set off by accident or by just anyone, because that would probably be bad. So the president asked his secretary of defense to make that happen. And the secretary of defense made it mandatory for there to be a passcode lock on the big red button that could make the world explode so that it would have to be communicated and entered deliberately so, to make sure that they were really sure that they wanted all of the fallout from that decision. <laughs> the, guy, thank you, the guy who was in charge of strategic air command thought it was a ridiculous system because it got in the way of making it easy to push the big red button when he needed to, and also because passcodes are annoying to remember. So he changed all the passwords, protecting all the copies of the big red button to a string of eight zeros. And this is why I'm pretty sure we are all living in some kind of weird splinter universe, because we didn't all die. <laughs> and because the world survived to make more bad password decisions, here's one more story for you. Once upon a time, there was a guy called Alan who was a PhD student at MIT. MIT had a computer. And much like my childhood, there was only one of them. And it was in very high demand because everybody wanted to use it, presumably like my childhood, to play Roller Coaster Tycoon. <laughs> so MIT decided what most parents decide, which is that sharing is nice. 
Um, so they divided up computer time among all of the MIT students into several hour blocks. And to stop people taking over other people's blocks of time, they put a lock system on the computer so that at the end of your allocated time, you would be logged out and the next person could come and log in. And Alan had been given four hours a week at, on this computer, which was pretty good for back then, but not good enough for the research that Alan was doing. So he had a look around on the computer while he was on it and discovered the file that kept all the usernames and passwords in it. This file was labeled passwords. <laughs> and it was in plain text because this was the first time that anyone had ever thought of using passwords on a computer and they clearly hadn't heard the story of Alibaba and the 40 thieves. <laughs> <clears throat> so Alan printed out the file, and then whenever he'd run out of his four hours, he would just get somebody else's credentials and log on again. And he also dumped all of this data for all of the other PhD students at MIT to use. He handed out copies of the printout because he was a nice guy, and also because if everyone was doing it, it would be harder to pin it on him. <laughs> and Alan got away with it, and people still get away with it. The ancient Greek warfare strategist Aeneas Tacticus once said that any good password should be easy to remember. The login system for my bank once said that any good password should be between 8 and 16 characters and contain at least one uppercase and one lowercase letter and at least one special character. As long as that character is at or hash or dollar sign, not something weird like a tilde or something that could break their database like a semicolon. <laughs> Um, and passwords which use characters with fancy umlauts or accented parts or, God forbid, emoji, <laughs> are very bad passwords who will be sent to bed without dessert. <laughs> I use the past tense there because when I read this, I switched banks. <laughs> the point in telling you all these stories is that we never really got to this point with regard to passwords. We have always been exactly where we are. We just made passwords more and more mandatory to get anything done, despite the fact that they were already a giant pain in the butt. And, that's, and also that security is not something that most people think about at all. And we all lived horribly ever after the end, because this whole situation is really kind of awful most of the time. But we know that we can do better. We enable multi-factor authentication on all our accounts and use a password manager and generate a long password. And we know that really the length of the password combined with the unpredictability, like a bunch of random words in a sequence, makes that password harder to crack than a short non-dictionary word with special characters. But not everybody knows that. And it's everybody else who builds and uses the internet most of the time, not the people in this room, mostly the other seven billion. So if we want to get it right for us, we have to make it right for them too. So here are some recommendations for five things you can do, we can do, as technical people, to make this ever so slightly better. Firstly, salt and hash any passwords that your system stores. If you're working on a system that doesn't do this, please make it do this. For those who are unsure how to do this, here is a quick overview. This is the average password. Someone uses this password for an account on your system, and so your system needs to remember it somehow. However, we don't want to store this in plain text or the PhD student Allens of the world will do what they've been doing since the 1960s. So we need to add some salt, which in this case means a random string that you add onto your password before you store it into your system, which should ideally be a little bit long and it should also be unique, meaning that you don't use the same salt on all the passwords in your database and private, meaning you don't publish this anywhere. Then, before you store it, you run the password and the salt together through a hashing algorithm, get the output of that algorithm, and maybe run it again a few times, and store that in your database. This example uses SHA-256 with only one round of hashing. And I know that people have a lot of opinions about which hashing, how, bleh, which hashing algorithms are the best, but there are two overall don'ts. Please don't try to write your own hashing algorithm. <laughs> There are plenty out there that are very good that were written by people with mathematics PhDs. Secondly, please don't use SHA-1 as your hashing algorithm, because even though it was developed by people with mathematics PhDs, it is an elderly algorithm and insecure by today's standards. So if you hash and salt all of the passwords that you're storing, even if your password database gets leaked, it will be difficult for an attacker to get all of those credentials and use them meaningfully because they won't be able to guess the password from its hash alone. 
and they will also have to guess the salt that you used and how many times you went around, which is infinitely more difficult. The good news is if you're wondering how to do this and you use Django, Django does this by default. Instead of having to bring all of this together manually, Django uses PBKDF2 to take care of all of the hashing and salting and doing it multiple times for you. And this is really slow to compute, but you want this because it also means that it takes infinity times longer for somebody trying to break this to do it. And they don't have your password, they don't know the password to start with, so they have to do this for many different permutations. So, and if you don't want to use the Django default, you can change that. You can use argon2 or bcrypt um, by changing the password hashes setting. And in my resources, which again I'll show a link to later, I've added literally just a link to the docs. Um, because as Jen noted this morning, the docs are excellent. And if I explained any more about this, I would just be reading them to you. Another thing that you can do on a Django project to help with passwords is to implement a lockout on the number of password attempts that people make. So if someone does try to log in maliciously, they won't get to try very many times. And they won't get to hammer your service with failed requests. Django Axis has you covered there. Because according to their docs, um, also Axis is used partly because it sounds like access and also because access is a thing you use to hack and it prevents hacking. Um, and one more thing, while we're here, please make sure that your service is using HTTPS when you handle login requests because it's no good to do all the fancy hashing and stuff if the initial password is sent to you in plain text in the first place. All right, second thing, multi-factor authentication. Implement multi-factor authentication on every system that you work on that you can. Passwords alone are not enough anymore. Multi-factor auth means that we need to have a password, you know, something that you know, and another piece of information, something that you have, before we let you into your account. Universal second factor, or U2F, is probably, in my opinion, the best second factor authentication that there is. Um, so that if you can implement it, if you can implement support for it, please do. Um, and U2F, for those who haven't had a chance to work with it yet, it requires a physical key, like a UB key, and that speaks directly to your browser and uses public key cryptography to uniquely identify you from everyone else. Um, and it also requires you to touch the keypad on it when it prompts you to do so, which means that even if a bot gets hold of the, the cert, there needs to be an actual person or something with capacitive touch to make it work. Um, and there's, it's, it's also quite hard to clone them. Uh, they're really cool. There's a lot of very cool stuff going on under the hood. I put a link to the white paper on it in my notes, or come talk to me about it afterwards, because I could talk about this for a very long time. Um, and yes, okay, it's a physical key, which is annoying, but you can also use this key for lots of different websites at once, instead of that bundle of RSA tokens for every single separate service that we all probably used to have. The other thing that I like about U2F is that it is an open source protocol, which means that anybody else should be able to pick it, up, pick it up and implement it. And Google does it, and Facebook does it, and Fastmail does it, and LastPass does it, and you can do it too. And there are a couple of other software token ways to do MFA. The most common one is TOTP. And for those who don't know, that's a time-based one-time password. Um, this generates a one-time password, which is usually about six digits long, based on a shared key and the current time. And these temporary passwords don't tend to live for long, between 30 seconds to five minutes, depending on your config. And you can deliver this token to a user lots of different ways. You can, some people build standalone apps, there's Google Authenticator, and a lot of services send tokens via SMS, but I wouldn't recommend doing this because it's trivially easy to, for a dedicated attacker to clone your SIM and get a hold of that token and attack you if they want to. Um, SMS as a second factor delivery mechanism has been deprecated by a lot of different companies and various industry standards boards, so I'd avoid it if you could. But <coughs> multi-factor authentication for Django is really easy. Yay. Um, Marcus Holton. <coughs> gave a really good talk at DjangoCon Australia last year about how to implement two-factor auth in Django. And he's already done that talk, so I'm not going to do that talk. Um, I've got a link to his blog post about it in my references list. Yes. Um, but the TLDR of it all is that 
the Django 2 factor auth package contains pretty much everything you need to support multi factor auth in your Django app. It includes U2F and TOTP. It's really cool. So go and check that out. Okay, third, make more than one multi factor option available for the people who want it. U2F and a one time password plus a password itself make things even harder for someone else to break into an account. Um, and I know that there have been a lot of headlines over the years about how this or that technology is going to be the password killer. Um, none of them really are. We still have lots of passwords. We get more of them all the time. But honestly, I think that a combination of different factors of various things, of things you know and things you have, is probably going to be the way forward in this case. That we might actually move away from something that is traditionally considered a password, but we're still going to have a bunch of different factors in some form or another. Um, as a side note, Fraser Tweedale is giving a talk tomorrow, I think, about social identities and federated login. Um, and this is another approach that is helping in the kill password fight, or at least the reduce passwords fight. Um, so if you want to know more about some of these tech, some of these technologies like SAML and OAuth and OpenID Connect, um, go and listen to his talk tomorrow. It should be good. Um, but in implementing multi-factor, the main thing to remember here is that even if you turn on all of the MFA, breaking these accounts is still possible. Nothing is ever, ever, ever going to be 100% secure. That said, um, implementing this stuff does make it an awful lot harder for people to try and hack into your users' accounts. So please turn it on. Okay. Fourth thing, help your clients write good password policies. And these good password policies tend to get rid of the special character requirements in favor of length, a minimum, mandatory minimum password length, and a randomness checker. Strictly speaking, the best passwords are long and hard to predict. It doesn't matter what kinds of special characters and numbers they contain, it's the length that really matters. Um, and you usually see mandatory, you usually see mandatory maximum lengths of 16 to 20 characters. But um, if you have these in your systems, I would encourage you to dish these entirely if you can. Longer is usually stronger. And mandatory minimum length is the best way to get people to actually generate something more secure. With that in mind, tell your clients about diceware passwords, by which I mean something that looks like this. Passwords made up of four or more random words. They're easy for humans to remember in a sequence, but hard for computers to guess. So this one is an example I generated a few hours ago. Um, it's a 40 character password. It isn't a predictable sentence. It's definitely something I could memorize if I really had to, but it's going to be hard for a computer to guess. Um, so make sure that your password policies support this type of password and don't reject it as a weak because it doesn't have a number or a symbol in it. Um, and some password managers will generate diceware passwords for you. But if you don't have one of those, um, I like to think of like things that were on the shelf in my bedroom when I was a kid and then list off a couple of those items or something like that. Something only you would know but you can remember really well. And other people, if you've generated them and you need to remember them for some reason, um, other people suggest making up small stories to go around these words. But good password policies are meaningless if you don't actually bring your users along for the ride. And using dice word password, um, dice word passwords it's also pretty meaningless if you don't use a password manager because then they're long and you have to remember them and then they're going to get repeated. So if they get stored in someone else's database and they're not doing the hashy salty thing and it gets leaked, then it's public anyway, despite all the things you're trying to do. So this is point 4A, education. For any of this that I'm talking about to be really effective, you need to educate people about good password hygiene and tell them about password managers. And by this, I don't mean just your users, but also your friends and your family, because good password practice, it goes way outside the scope of your work project. Like this is a long-term, real-life, meat-space effort, more than anything else. Gift people subscriptions, um, or teach them how to use KeePass, the KeePass X. I think of password managers, they're kind of like a, a Band-Aid on the whole problem of passwords. They don't really solve the fact that we have all of these passwords to deal with, but as the name suggests, they do make them easier to manage. Long strings like the ones I'm recommending are really hard to deal with without them. So there's LastPass, there's OnePassword, KeePass, Dashlane, lots of them. 
All of them have their strengths and their weaknesses, but using any one of them is better than none at all. So get out there and start showing people how to use them. Back within the scope of your work projects, a quick and easy way to educate your users about strong passwords is to give them automatic client-side feedback on the passwords they give you when you're signing up or changing them. Dropbox came up with this, this solution. It's called ZXCVBN. Um, this gives instant feedback to users on the strength of their passwords, and it determines strength based on the length, uh, no, de determines strength based on how long a string would take to crack, rather than what kinds of uppercase and lowercase and symbols and things are in it. Um, it also contains a dictionary of common words and passwords from previous leaked database dumps, so you can help your users avoid those. And it's been ported to Python and a bunch of other languages. It's JavaScript natively. It's all really well supported. Um, go and check that out. All right, point five. Rethink the idea of working on systems that are using biometrics as the only form of authentication. This is the medium length form of a particular rant of mine, but the basic thrust of it is that if your password gets compromised, you can change it. If your, finger, if your fingerprints get compromised, it is hard to grow new fingers. And when I say compromised, biometrics can be compromised in a bunch of different ways, more ways than a straight up password can. Passwords get leaked in database dumps and on post-it notes, but we keep coming up with new ways to steal biometric information all the time. Late last year, Adobe released a software called Voco. This can generate new samples of somebody speaking um, after being fed about 20 minutes of speaking data from them. So I'm someone who narrates audiobooks in my spare time. And I can really appreciate the idea of not having to go to the studio for a 10 minute re-recording of something. But I am also someone who works closely with authentication software. And I can see the potential for someone to get one of my recordings, even the recording of this talk, hi. Um, and feed it to Voco, and then have it rattle off my mic of passphrase. Um, and for anyone thinking of doing this, you won't be able to do that with this service or any other service that I, am, that I use, but if you've given a conference talk or there's a recording view out there, think about what is becoming possible with this. Don't enroll yourself in this stuff and don't build it into your systems. And there's more good news for a given value of good. In January, some researchers in Japan discovered that the average smartphone can capture detailed images of your fingerprints from up to three meters away if the lighting is good. Um, and this means that you can get fingerprint information from any Facebook selfie where you throw up a peace sign um, or steal the fingerprint patterns of a public figure if they were photographed in public and they weren't wearing gloves. Not unrelatedly, there have been a lot of really cool recent breakthroughs in 3D printing of human skin, which is great for many people. Um, but it also means that a lot of this Gattaca style biometric fakery just got kind of real. Um, but digital stealing and faking is the softer approach. In 2005, an accountant in Malaysia parted company with one of his fingertips after the people who stole his Mercedes realized that they needed his fingerprint to start it. Slightly less violently, there was the story of the six-year-old girl last year who used her sleeping mother's thumbprint to unlock her iPhone and buy herself $250 worth of Pokemon toys. <laughs> Biometric auth looks really cool in the movies, but the movies are also where people get their eyeballs taken out in order to bypass it. Um, there is a lot of cool stuff about living in the future, but I don't want to bring this part into it. So if you're working with a project that's thinking about biometrics, see if there are any other options first before you go into this. <laughs> and if you must use biometrics, make sure that they're only one part of several factors needed to authenticate because they are very easy to hack, both technologically and socially and kind of literally and gruesomely. <laughs> Six-year-olds can do it. So to recap, salt and hash. Implement MFA, support U2F. Enable more than one MFA. Write proper password policies and educate people about passwords to make sure that they know why you're doing that. And say no to standalone biometrics. Again, this is a link to all of my notes and all of the things that I've mentioned here and a few of the news articles to prove that, yes, even the Malaysia fingertip thing is true. Um, so you can take a picture and look it up later if you need to. And, okay. I know that all of these things are all just really small things and they're not gonna make the world perfect. And they won't make any of us completely, quote unquote, unhackable. But they will make the state of things a tiny bit better, the more and more that each of us tries. 
I would really love to write a happy ending to this horror story of passwords, so please help me do that. Thank you. Well, that was sufficiently terrifying. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for the blood and stuff that you will be taking because things, I don't know, it's a mug. Yay! <laughs> you could collect lots of stuff. You've probably already got my fingerprints on that. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs>